you know, not all humans are rational, and sometimes they're going to get in their own head. That even if you're not actually guilty of something, you're guilty of something. Chris, that's probably the biggest understatement <laughs> of, that I've ever heard. Yes, not um, all humans are rational. This week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris hold a roundtable discussion on Telltale's The Walking Dead Season 2. Plus, some chats about King's Quest, self-censorship in Street Fighter V, and Kojima's absence at the VGAs. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Backward Compatible. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 53 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast. I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hello. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And our meaty topic of the discussion for today is going to be our uh, roundtable uh, talk on The Walking Dead Season 2 by Telltale Games. Um, Walking Dead Season 1 was uh, much praised um, as kind of being the first of the modern Telltale era, in a sense, um, for its uh, very interesting storytelling and the way that made a lot of people feel really attached to the characters and to the scenario. Um, And we've talked at length before about the narrative structure and how it appears to be more branching on first playthrough than on second inspection, maybe not so much. Uh, But in any case, this is the second season, and um, we're going to be talking a little bit about our impressions of that. Uh, but first, let's go ahead and dive into our uh, opening segments, including the button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So the game I've been playing recently is another adventure game. It's by, uh, I believe the developer is The Odd Gentleman, and it's uh, King's Quest. So this was a, a series that I sort of grew up with uh, by Sierra Entertainment, or Sierra Online Entertainment. Uh, back pretty pretty popular back in the 80s and early 90s, and then it kind of fell away once adventure games sort of lost their allure. Uh, they kind of were, were being built on some of the earliest games with, with graphics and earliest games with sound, and they kind of pushed the envelope on PC. Once they were no longer doing that, there wasn't really, they didn't really have a lot of um, popularity. Regicide. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, but this this new revival, um, and to be honest with you, going back and playing some of those, especially the earlier ones, um, were not really designed that well. Very frustrating in terms of the gameplay. Uh, but they did have some charm to them, and I actually think this this new edition um, really is kind of the best one in a lot of ways. I mean, it's got it's very different from an adventure game standpoint, but um, it is very much in the you know storytelling vein. Different how? Well, you don't have... It's not really so much about inventory management, which was the first one was all about. You find something, you pick it up, and then you find different ways to use it, and it was a lot of trial and error. Yeah. Um, this one is a little bit more focused on the storytelling, and even though you can technically die, you start right back from where you started, um, like a few seconds back kind of thing, because you're, the whole thing is sort of framed in kind of similar to how Prince of Persia, you were, the story was being told by the prince, he was telling his mm-hmm. own story. Um, in this one, the story the storyteller is King Graham, um, and as an old man, and he's telling stories to his granddaughter, uh, voiced by Christopher Lloyd, who does a great job. The granddaughter is? Uh, <laughs> yes, the granddaughter is voiced by Christopher Lloyd. Uh, no, the the of course, old King Graham is yeah. voiced by... I'm not sure who does the granddaughter. Um, she does good, too. Actually, the voice acting is one of the strongest features of this game, that yeah, of the actually, art style. Actually, uh, I've watched a little bit of a Let's Play of that first chapter, mm-hmm. and um, I actually was impressed. The the little girl didn't come across as obnoxious, which is no, a trap to all. fall into with child actors. Yeah. No, not a, it, that's probably because I wouldn't be surprised if it's not a child actor. Mm. That's a good point. It's probably an adult pretending to be a child actor, mm-hmm. uh, which tends to happen a lot in voice acting. Um, but yeah, Christopher Lloyd does a great job. Um, now, I'm not sure who does the voice of young Graham. It's, of course, not the same person. Um, But he also does a good job, too. And the idea in this first chapter is, um, you know, sort of Graham's quest to become a knight. Um, So he's not even a knight yet, let alone a king. Um, But it's it's pretty cool. He comes, he essentially has to, first he has to actually get to the knight um, sort of initiation test, and then he has to pass it, and only one of the knights can pass it. And they all have their own little, um, you know, quirks about one of them's really strong, one of them's really fast, one of them's supposed to be really clever. And Graham's whole thing is he's not the smartest or strongest or the smartest, but he has, like, a really big heart. So that's kind of his his sort of take. And he finds ways, and he does also sort of outsmart people at times, and he's 
he does have his own cleverness to him, but um, a big part of that is that kind of like this running theme is that he kind of finds a way to, um, you know, beat him with kindness sort of thing. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's a little corny. Just and there's like the GED. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's definitely a lot of, um, real equivalency. <laughs> oh, yeah. gotcha. All right. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, there's, there's a lot of, um, sort of corniness to it. A lot of puns. Uh, they kind of make fun of themselves a lot in the game because the original King's Quest series had a lot of puns in them. And so in this one, uh, Old King Graham as the narrator keeps, he'll keep throwing out puns and his granddaughter will call him out on him for being terrible. <laughs> nice. It's kind of a running joke. And if you keep clicking on the same things or doing attempting the same things, he'll come up with new puns each time until he runs out, of course. Is it active generation? Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Yes, yeah. Actually, the um, the gameplay reminded me a bit of um, a, a, like a little bit like you were saying, less of the find an item, combine it with another item, click on the thing, trial and error. It has a lot more sort of environmental cues and sort of like it reminded me a bit of Zelda in a sense. A little um, bit, yeah. Like a, a slightly less complex, a little bit more linear adventure style mm-hmm. Zelda. Um, and because, you still have some options though. Yeah. Um, because then, you know, you'll come up to something and it's like, okay, here's a gap and here's a bow and here's a rope. Oh, I need to put the rope on the bow so I can shoot this thing and then slide across or whatever mm-hmm. the case might be. And so like, it, it's stuff that at least in the first chapter, I imagine might get a little bit harder as you go along. Um, sort of, you know, in a way, some obvious sort of solutions, but I think they're trying to ease you into the way that they're trying to get, handle puzzle solving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you do have options. There's at certain points you have options of approaching, um, problems in different ways. And some, t- some ways you can be a lot more direct and in others you can be a little bit more um you know cunning have a little guile to your to your to your solution and then there's um then there's the other where you just go like straight pure compassion and you're just going to help people and then hope that it somehow works out for you (laughs) which is honestly i had more fun doing that um that solution like uh for example one of them was oh yeah sure you can take this like weapon and go try to because your first test is to find a um the eyes of a of a you know, hideous beast, you're supposed to return them. And you can either go try to get a weapon from the um, blacksmith to go hunt this beast because you don't have, you're not armed with anything. That seems the most direct. Um, or you can basically just trick them into thinking you have an eye by like basically building one of your of your own through like the apothecary or magic shop or whatever. <laughs> but then the third option was, oh yeah, um, you just go to the baker and, he, and you, he'll give you a pie and you can just use the pie. What are you going to use the pie for? Well, you know, it's a pie. It's, you'll, you'll find something for it. You'll, you'll, you'll help someone out with this pie, and it'll somehow help you win. So, of course, I chose the pie just to see what the deal was. But, yeah, yeah it, it's cool. You end up giving it to this giant bridge troll, and there's just a lot of, like, a lot of cool back-and-forth stuff that kind of happens. All the, the little knights that are your, your opposition all have their own little quirks, and they all seem like they're probably kind of jerks, but then you realize, eh, not really. They have their own good qualities, too. So it's kind of interesting in that regard. Um, I did want to talk about one scene. Um before I move on, that I thought was really clever, and I'm hoping they do more of this in the later chapters. Um, this game just came out in the summer, by the way, June, I believe, of this year. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this scene where there's a whole bunch of rock goblins, and they're essentially essentially goblins that disguise themselves as rocks. So when you walk into this clearing, the camera stays back at the entrance, so the clearing doesn't follow you as, Graham wa- as, you, as you have Graham walk forward. So as you're walking forward the rocks, like, step up, and they're, they're actually goblins wearing, like, little rock thing, humps on their back to pretend like they're rocks, and they're, like, creeping towards you. So as the player, you're seeing this, and you're like, wait a minute, and you stop and you turn around, and they all kind of duck back and hide. So, and then you're like, oh, that's weird. And so you walk forward again, and now suddenly they're coming <laughs> nice. after you. So it's, it's, it's really neat how, like, it's almost like Graham senses there's something back there, but he doesn't know, but you know, but you have to walk forward because mm-hmm. there's no other way to go, really. So they, they do a lot of this playing with the camera kind of element. It has almost like a, I don't want to say cinematic, more of like a cartoon Yeah, I was feel. about to say cartoon. Like yeah. a very kind of Disney-esque. Um, what we do is what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that too. I, I do think that that's the biggest strong suit of this, of this game because it's really not challenging, but it is fun Mm -hmm. and charming and it's got really good graphics and uh excuse me uh voice acting and music so if you're into that sort of thing i I definitely recommend it nice that was a b-52 song wasn't it rock rock goblin (laughs) a rock goblin rock goblin i think that was the lobster but uh, oh yeah close enough might have been cool if it was goblin doc do you want to mosh for us for just a few minutes sure sure um, well, I, I've been playing the the one game to rule them all. Mm. Uh, Lord was, of the Rings, a new Lord of the Rings game. Oh, no, no, <laughs> it was described to me as the, um, the the best broken game ever. 
Um, and that would, of course, be Fallout 4. Mm-hmm. Uh, gotten a little bit deeper into it to see some of the so-called glitches that you're talking about. They're few and far between. Um, I've played... Well, I, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but uh, 12 days worth. And I don't mean game days. I mean literal, actual days. Um, oh, that's a lot. 24-hour days? Yeah. 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 So... I, I have actually put in that many hours into the game, and I'm only level 30, which is kind of ridiculous. But um, at the same time, I'm having so much fun with it, I can't stand it. Because I will, I will sit around in town and just, just build things. Um, but yeah, you're, you're a builder, right? You like, you like doing all the little building. Oh, well, I am, yeah. Putting I mean, things together. And... My, Minecraft mods, all that kind of right. thing. I was looking forward to Fortnite. It never came out, and mm. that, that kind of thing. So yeah, whenever there's a, a building mod. Uh, and there are a few quirks with it. Um, it took me a while to figure out that some walls will fit with other walls and snap and others won't, that kind of a thing. But honestly, what um, what I'm really interested in, in, in talking about and excited and enjoying in the game that I think that they really did right um, has to do with the sort of modular aspect of the game. It seems like there's an overall philosophy of modularity, and I love modularity in design. Mm. So the fact that your um, your armor, your power armor, for example can be modded um, individually, like the pieces, mm-hmm. individually, arms and, and, and head and helmet and all that stuff. But um, not only that, but your guns individually can be modded. And so what I've started doing is I'll pick up a gun that has a, a mod or a cool thing. You kill a legendary, you always get a legendary kind of gun. And then what you do is you start modding that gun and you collect, maybe in, in crates or something, other guns of that type. And then what you do when you get your crafting is you craft one of them to become just the simplest kind of gun that there is, and you take the parts from it, the mods from it, and you put it over in the legendary gun, and by the time you're done, without crafting legendary stuff, only by crafting simple stuff, you've got a legendary gun with mm. full mods. Nice. So that's the kind of thing that I've been doing, and, and just having a blast with it. And, and that's things that I, I love in games. Now that said, um, I feel like the characterization in this game has, has been done better mm. than some of the, the fallouts in the past. I didn't really like any of the characters in New Vegas, I didn't really like very many of the characters in 3. Um, not since 2 have I really, truly loved the characters in a Fallout game. Mm-hmm. Um, but the mechanics have always been good enough and, and fun enough for me to do it. In this one, I feel like not only do I have meaningful relationships and meaningful characters and meaningful plots, but I've also got solid mechanics and I've got something that uh, I'm finding truly enjoyable, which is the modding system. So and those gonna... are my three main points for, for Fallout. Something I was cool. going to ask you about, too, because our good buddy Richard uh, posted an article, or I think a video, rather, where someone was talking. I didn't watch it because I didn't want to spoil anything. I mm-hmm. haven't played the game much yet. Um, but basically, it seems like there's a lot of complaint about your ability to actually role play in this game. And I know that we talked about, you know, you said yeah. that basically the four options, and it's almost like uh, we sort of established it, kind of like a toolkit, in a yeah. way, where you have a certain, like a set number of responses that you can use with different people at different times. But and do you one feel seems like... to always be the sarcastic choice. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. Do, do you got, feel like you you're... Four. Do you feel like you're able to, like, be any character you want to be in this game, or is it more like you're going to be generally this, maybe with no, a no. few tweaks? I, I think, honestly, what it comes down to is when you're faced with the, the so-called infinite shelf, mm-hmm. um, it, what they tend to do is they give you lots of options, and then you'll either have a positive outcome or a negative outcome at the end of the conversation mm-hmm. with the older Fallout games. Mm-hmm. In this one... Uh, you, you actually have true branching dialogue, mm-hmm. which if you understand the math behind branching dialogue and, and in any kind of branching content, mm-hmm. there's a reason why we bottleneck. It's right. because the more content you create, the more difficult it is. The fact that they've actually done four in branching trees of dialogue is extremely impressive. That's mm-hmm. an extremely high number if you go deeper than, say, about four responses. Because what you're talking about is four to the fourth power yeah. at that point. And then you have to record all that. Mm-hmm. And... Well, that's. I'll just interject. You don't have to record all that. They chose to record all that. Well, okay, but the ongoing war against. I'm still. I'm still annoyed. Yeah, I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I've gone on record. I'm not a fan of voice acting. And everything. Yeah, but. but but what people I think fail to understand is that your stats are gating responses that never show up. So instead of having responses that you will fail by um, not having the stat, what what it's doing is it's giving you a stat option um, that you might or might not fail simply because of the stat. Interesting. And the other things that it's doing um, contextually is if, if you walk up to a guy and he's kind of a kind of a jerk and you're really nice to him, he's going to shut down the conversation. He's, he's not going to like that. 
But if you're sarcastic to him, he's going to be like, ha ha, I knew I was going to like you, you mm-hmm. punk. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have to think contextually about how you are going to role play that character. Are you going to be consistent with the character and be a nice guy? Because if so, you're going to get walked on by people in the wasteland. Mm. Are you going to be sarcastic all the time? Because if so, there's going to be you know genuine paragons out there who are going to hate you. And there's going to be companions who are going to be like uh, sticking around for 10 minutes and then taking off because they're, they can't handle your attitude. Interesting. Whereas if you go and, and, you're, and you're just hitting that circle button all the time and you're like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to be a smart aleck just mm-hmm. every single time. There's going to be a couple companions who will like that. There's going to be a couple of people in the wasteland who will like that. But a lot of people are going to give you trash. And you're basically playing a raider at that point and you need to act like one. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. I, I really enjoy... The way that characters walk up to you and initiate conversations, it, it feels natural and it feels right. But the, the it's wonderful also thing you can just walk away from one. Yes, and that's the wonderful thing about it. So let me ask you just real quick about characters walking up and initiating conversation. Mm-hmm. Does that not seem a little odd to you if someone is a stranger in your town and he has like a bunch of guns strapped to his back and you're walking up like, "Hey, dude, what's up?" No, or because not. Uh, first of all, you're a legendary. By the first couple hours in, you've done something impressive enough that pretty much everybody who knows who you are has heard of you. But isn't afraid of you. Well, some are. Some aren't. And that's the thing. Initiating conversation doesn't mean, hey, buddy, how it's going. Initiating conversation means, hold it right there. Are you a raider or are you a traitor? And like, then you get four options. You can say, I'm a raider. I'm a traitor. Whoa, don't shoot me. I'm a traitor. Or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and something sarcastic. Is there a, like... Is there a way when you're in conversation, can you in- immediately close out of the conversation and just attack? Yeah. I'm assuming that's an option as well. well and, and you actually, like Chris was saying, there, there is no way to close out of a conversation. You simply walk away. Walk away. And actually, or, they'll, they'll or move the cursor away. Like, yeah. You can, they'll keep talking to you, and basically, you can choose whether you want to like sort of go back and respond to what they said or just walk away. Yeah. So, or uh, and then when you do walk away, to the face. yeah, yeah. And when you do you walk away, do you can pull out your gun. <laughs> or uh, what was it? Yeah, Sorry, the Ripper, the Ripper. There. And so, <laughs> instead of having to wait for the conversation tree to be over to act, you just act. It's wonderful. This week in gaming history. All right, so I have a uh, this week in gaming history segment, and it's actually a game that that I love, and is one of the the most influential games. Frogger. Uh, well, Frogger, it had its own influence, but I was never really a huge fan. No. I'm um, going to try to guess. Okay. I'm going to read your mind. <laughs> um, end of the world, um, uh, something calamity, uh, it's, it's not quite coming to me. <laughs> doom, yes. Ah, doom, doom, yes. 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 Of course, close. Chris sees my show notes over here as well. <laughs> uh, cheater. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, Doom released actually, uh, December 10th, 1993. Um, and oh, the good old days. yes, uh, a, a, an old, an old, old uh, DOS game. Of course, Doom. You play uh, the quintessential space marine before it was quintessential, and um, That's a you're good point. yeah, you're you're <laughs> running around as as this you know you're just Doom guy. You don't even have a name. You're just the Doom guy, Doom guy, the space marine running around and killing uh, demons essentially. I thought he was the Rock. Uh, yeah, in in the movie, he is played by the Rock, which honestly, I mean. I guess that kind of makes some sense, like like build wise. So. The yeah. only the only problem is Doom Guy doesn't really say much, and The Rock kind of. He's talking about. He has great lines like "uh" and yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> "Oh yeah." <laughs> Or that's like, the Kool-Aid that's man. Yeah. No, that was the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's it, this game was of course uh, designed by John Romero and programmed by uh, John Carmack. Of course, there was some some back and forth between both of them in both roles, but that's that's what they're both kind of known for. Um, Romero doing a lot of the design, level design, setting everything up, coming up with some of the ideas, and then Carmack doing the nitty gritty of the programming, especially the programming for the engine itself, the original id, id tech engine. Um, which also saw a lot of use. So the big thing about Doom is, even though it's often talked about as the first FPS, it's really not, um, but it was the most influential FPS, the one that really kind of put the genre on the map, yeah. and the one that became um, pretty much known as like the standard for many years. And for quite a while after it came out, people didn't make FPS as they made Doom clones. Well, and they... And that's there, all, that's all a, you would call them. It's like, this is a Doom clone. Exactly. It took about, what was it? I, I, I'd have to look it up again. I saw a chart where... Honestly, I think Quake is what changed that. Because then you couldn't call it a Doom clone anymore. Yeah. 
you had to call it a Quake clone, and by that point, there were mm-hmm. genuine FPSs out there. And uh, you know, Quake was developed by it as well. Of course. So <laughs> these, I mean, these guys know F- they know how to do FPSs. Oh yeah. Um, and of course, they did Wolfenstein 3D as well, which was another one a little bit before Doom, one of the earliest FPSs as mm-hmm. well. Some say the earliest. It kind of depends on who you talk to. There's a few. There's a few yeah. other possible contenders. Well, it didn't have a roof, so it doesn't count. Yeah. There you go. This is the Gaming Meta, news and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. So we have a few issues to talk about, and we're just going to kind of touch on these real quick. We'll go back and forth and um, do a quick, like, hey, what do you think about that? Real fast, back and forth, so for time purposes. Uh, So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about censorship. So um, apparently Capcom is sort of going wholesale with uh, the censorship of Street Fighter. Uh, Street Fighter V, specifically. There's now one of the new characters they've introduced, um, R. Mika. She is a Japanese professional wrestler, mm. um, and of course she dresses like a Japanese professional wrestler, <laughs> and she has a very bombastic uh, style like a Japanese professional wrestler. If you've ever watched prof- female professional wrestlers, they do the sort of things that All she does. All the time. Uh, well, I actually, I actually have. <laughs> and thing? I didn't know. Yeah, it, it, oh, it's, I'm, aware, it's I'm definitely a big, aware it's a thing. No, it's yeah. a big thing, and <laughs> okay. it's, it's huge in Japan, very popular. Um, and, I mean, those ladies, they really get into it, very physical. But some of the things that, that, that Armika does that have, has sort of come under um, criticism over here, she does things like she has like a butt slap as part of her like taunt. That's the big one that they really don't like. But she has other moves where she'll do like a splits, splits kick, that kind of okay, thing. Okay, so I'm imagining female sumo wrestlers right now. Am I totally off? You're no, off. No, no, no. You're, you're off. off. Okay. They're, Cl- closer to WWE, that sort of thing. Yeah, they're, they're more like athletic women. So think like Ronda Rousey as a professional wrestler, that sort of build, not okay. not sumo wrestling. I think my headspace is and, and, and very, very theatric, very yes. Yeah. This this changes with the butt slap now. I'm, I'm okay. With you. <laughs> um, no, but uh, Capcom is actually, unfortunately, they've been starting. To, they've actually started to uh, censor the game. They said they're actually going to censor more of it. They've gone so far as to say that they're going to release a statement. They're going to try to. Um, Set the PC port to try to try to prevent mods, so that people can't go back and add back in these scenes. Hmm. Um, it's actually gotten some Japanese gamers in sense too, because they're not just censoring it for the Western release; they're censoring it because it's easier for them just to release one version. Sure. Mm-hmm. So they're censoring it for them too, because of this possible outcry in the West. Huh. So personally, I think it's a bunch of BS because I'm very anti-censorship. Well, Street Fighter's always but, been, um, like, caricatured and I know. over the top. I know. And, yeah. I feel like, I mean, we. I feel like it's one of those things where we're, we're going back into this video games need to be censored mode that we were in in the 90s. Only now, instead of, we, go, we must censor video game violence because people are going to kill each other. Now it's like we must censor video game sexiness. Yeah. Because, what, we're going to have, like, women dressing as professional wrestlers and, like, slapping their butts on the street or something? Which... Okay, I'm fine with that, but I don't think that's going to happen. I mean, I don't think... It's the same thing with, like, violence. It's not like if you play a, a fighting video game, you're suddenly going to become more violent. That's right. Now, kill anybody who's just different. And I will. Yes, there you go. Or, yeah. or And then afterward, I'll slap my butt. Yeah, there you there go. we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, anything you guys want to add before we go to the next issue? I or? mean, like, I, I just want to say that, like, I get where people are coming from when they're concerned about this sort of stuff, but there's, I think... Well, what, what is the cause for concern? Because I, I don't get it. If you don't like it, that's fine. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's kind no of No one's thing. forcing like, you to play the game. Yeah, you're free to dislike something. And, and if you're a parent, you're free that, to tell your kid not to... Don't let your kid play it if you if don't want to play it. If we're really concerned about how like a given type of person or whatever is portrayed in a game, it should be in a context that's like more real. Like if we're trying to present this as realistic, then maybe we can have concerns about like you know the sort of social implications of stuff like that. Are you but saying a Japanese Fighter, a Japanese professional wrestler fighting a Brazilian hairy monster? And that's is exactly, it realistic? That's exactly my point. Okay. Is that like <laughs> this game? Like first of all, it's like someone's in character too. Oh yeah, and characters are going to be characters, you know. So in this particular case, I don't know why we're up in arms about something like Street Fighter. And they all have weird, their own little weird quirks. Mm-hmm. All the Street Fighter characters have weird things. I that mean, they do. Street Fighter's a racist game if you want to look at it that way. I mean, every, I actually, everybody's super stereotyped. I actually disagree with <laughs> it. I actually think I, I do think that there's a lot of uh, they, they rely on tropes a lot. Mm-hmm. But I think if you actually look at the cast. It's actually the most diverse cast in gaming. Oh, diverse, I mean, it yeah. Has, I mean, like, individual characters and in the way they're portrayed. But I don't think they're portrayed in a negative way. Oh, no, I agree. It's all, it's definitely, I would say, stereotypical, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't say racist. Well, people sometimes will conflate the two. Stay That's tuned for episode 54, which will be all about the difference between tropes, stereotypes, and... Uh, actually, it won't be, because that'll be our holiday special. Oh, yeah, that's true. 
Unless maybe a holiday yeah, special. Yeah, no, there's no stereotypes in holiday special. <laughs> uh, none whatsoever. Anyway. Uh, okay. I guess, Archetypes. That's the word I'm There you go. For. Thank you. I, I guess we'll go ahead and move on to the next issue. But well, Just real quick. Oh, yeah. Sure. Is it, sorry. I mean, okay, is it con- uh, Capcom that is censoring itself, or is it because of some kind of pushback? Yes. Or? It's, because of, it's because there's been a bunch of pushback, and Capcom is worried By that... By who? Um, various journalists like have been, for example, Playboy wrote, I'm not even kidding, wrote an article about how it is, um, this is objectifying women to have Armika yeah, in Yeah, but they're like not going to be showing new Playboy. women anymore. I know, but that's what I just want to, I just want it to be, to be known that Playboy is concerned about objectifying women. So this is an extreme disconnect in their mentality where they're thinking that a video game in which a fictional character slaps her butt that's wrong. That's objectifying women. But for like 50 years having a magazine in which you're literally objectify, you're literally having women as objects to be ogled. That's literally the entire point of your magazine. Mm. That's not. That's okay. This is what we're getting. This hypocrisy. There were women in the magazine as well. <laughs> yeah, I only, only read the article. Yeah, there you go. I only read <laughs> I mean, the article. We knew exactly. about this in the first of place. Course. No, but <laughs> um, it, yeah, so yes, there's been a lot of a lot of um, because it was out in the arcades first, and uh-huh. so they've already been exposed to it before the the home, the home edition, which is starting to come out. Oh, I see. So Capcom, the um, I believe it was the. Uh, director of something of the project. I, f- I forgot the name of the so, person. So wait, it's okay Literally, in our malls, but not in our homes? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Where little kids could be walking by. No, no, I'm, I'm telling you, the whole the whole thing is just absurd. Yeah. Um, it, it is really quite absurd. And, you know, I just, I don't understand. The, their basic statement was, like, we want to make sure that, um, like, you got to be careful to make sure that everyone can play it. And we're going to make sure, we're going to go through and we're going to look at any sort of offensive content and possibly remove it as sort of their statement. There's a dangerous road to go down when you're concerned about pleasing everyone. Of course. You never, you never will. Everyone. You never will. Because, well, like you were saying with the whole, oh, some of it is racist. I mean, you could technically go through and just remove every character. Because, well, you know, this person is a stereotype of mm-hmm. this. This person is a stereotype of that's, that. That's my Literally point, the whole yeah. cast is and a stereotype like, of you know, something. The thing is, just like they're, they're, if, even if they are making fun of people, and I don't think they are, but even if they are... You know, like, they sort of do it, it's a, it's a equal opportunity satire, you know? Yeah. The, the whole Parody. series is presented as, um, t- like, tongue-in-cheek, yeah. not to be taken that seriously with, mm-hmm. with the way their stories are set up, their characters. They're all so presented in such an over-the-top way that if you take these characters as real, like, like, like uh, uh, Ryu, he's just completely this over-the-top, like, uh, prototypical Japanese fighter his life is to train that is all yeah, that yeah. His existence. and 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 that's and that's and they're making fun of their own culture with that you know mm-hmm. like the just like the um over dedicated to work focused only on like his one task mm-hmm. it's like solo minded you know it's just ab- absurd and they're kind of making fun of them, themselves too mm-hmm. so they're 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 very equal opportunity when it comes to that yeah. but it's not none of it i is done in a malicious way it's yeah, all yeah. done as just a we're going to take these traits that are sort of associated with either this culture or this particular subset of a culture and just ramp it up to 11 and just have fun with it. It's iconographic. It's meant to, in a game with no plot, get yeah. across a character through the way that they look and the way that they fight. Because otherwise, you just have a bunch of characters that are boring and kind of look different, and you just call it Tekken, and for some reason, people buy it. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> Sorry. Did you have something else you were going to say, Doc? <laughs> I think as long as Capcom mm. understands who they are what they are, and has an identity that they're trying to push forward, then if they choose to censor themselves in order to stick within the context of that, it makes sense. It's as if Disney were to say, you know what, we had something that was coming out, it was over-sexualized, we've chosen to pull back. I think everybody would go, go Disney. Yeah, yeah the, di- yeah. the difference here, though, is that Disney has always pr- presented its itself in a certain light to a certain audience. And that's my point. Whereas Capcom is now trying to move away from something that they have done for pretty much since their inception. Right. And that's the difference. And that's, I think, the main thing that people have a problem with. So if they are branding, are they trying to rebrand themselves, I salute them. If instead they are caving to some kind of weird popular opinion, then they're not going to last as a company very long. That seems to be that seems to be what they're doing, but it's still a little too early to say for sure. Yeah. Um, maybe another, it's just a another clever way to uh, is, maybe it's just a clever way to move the conversation away from the DLC model. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Possibly, so, possibly so. But I mean, you know, Rockstar they they they've made money from the very beginning on being mm-hmm. over the top and completely offensive. That's who they mm-hmm. are. It doesn't bother me. Nothing they put out bothers oh, yeah. me. No, and I and I and I'm sure we need to have a whole episode where we do nothing but talk about Rockstar because I love that company so much. The you got games. It. 
basically every game they put out, I just I, I fall in love with. Like, yeah, really just a great job. that Columbine simulator that they did. <laughs> oh god, I love that game so. It got such a bad rap, and no, no one game. played it. It was a fantastic game. Mm-hmm. You're the exact opposite of a bully. Anyway, I'm getting off track. Um, okay, <laughs> so we do have one more story that I just wanted to touch on just a little bit uh, before we get to our, our last segment, um, and that is the um, Game Awards that came out recently. Uh, in the Game Awards... Which Game Awards? The Game the Awards. awards. The, yes, the like, Game Awards. Like uh, Vietnamese the... Game Awards? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's they, they didn't actually come up with a clever name. They just call them The Game Awards. I, I believe this is the second year they've done it, right? Uh, it in this format. They've been doing it for a while, but I think they called it like the Game... Well, I, I think it was on Spike. It was originally on Spike, and yes. I think they had like some title for it. Yeah, it was it. the Spike Game Awards. Might have was been. It? Might yeah, have been, yeah. Uh, sure. But anyway, so regardless, the, the point is that um, uh, Metal Gear Solid was up for Game of the Year, Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, which it, you know, it should have been, it should have been up for game of the year and it, and it was, and it ended up winning for, uh, I believe the, um, action category or action adventure, one of those. Um, it didn't win flat out game of the year, but it was up for the award. And of course, various people related to designing the game were invited because they always try to invite developers and have them up there accept their own rewards. Sure. Initially, Kojima was invited. Well, he was unable to attend because he was banned from the event and he was banned because Konami had their lawyers contact um, whoever was putting on the Game Awards, which I guess would be, not Spike, but is it still uh, Spike or whatever Spike company? doesn't exist. Yeah, Je- it's whatever company. Jeff Keighley is kind of like the yeah. big producer for this. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, they, they contacted his representatives or what have you and I'm said, I got that name wrong. If, if they allow Kojima to come to this event, they are not going to allow them to show any footage of Metal Gear Solid Five. any mention of... them from showing footage? I think it would, they're just threatened to sue them, I think is what it was. Because they basically just threatened to sue them, and they basically caved. They probably couldn't have done anything legally. I don't know, but technically, I could sue you right now for like having a gray shirt. Yeah, I mean, I could. I, I wouldn't win, but if I had enough money, I could force you to go to court and spend money on a lawyer to defend yourself for having a gray shirt. That's true. I mean, it's, it'd be absurd. A judge would probably would throw it out in a few minutes, but hey, it's my constitutional it. right to have a fool for a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Representing yourself. Exactly. Ah. (laughs) Uh, But yes, um, I think this whole thing is completely ridiculous. Uh, As you know, I am a fan of Kojima. Um, And given his um, status as the designer of Metal Gear Solid, I don't understand why they wouldn't want him to be there. I I think it's it's the sort of thing where if if you're Konami and you're trying to say, oh, no, 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 all the stuff that you're hearing about the horrible conditions that our employees are under and that all these horrible things that we're doing. Oh, it's just exaggerated. We're, we're, we're a good company. We're not going to step out of AAA games, and we're still going to be making these games, and we still, we still value our employees and all this stuff. And then to do something like this to a gaming icon and mm-hmm. someone that, is, that has got, made them a lot of money, mm-hmm. a lot of money. It's like this would be the perfect opportunity to just kind of be like, oh, yeah, we've always been right on board with this project, and look what a great job we did. It's getting so many awards and accolades, right. and, yeah, we're awesome. And, and having, like, the, one of the people, like, the higher-up execs in the company showing up, sitting with mm-hmm. Kojima, going up when, to, like, when he did win the, his the back best awards. Yeah. He goes up to accept shaking, award. Shaking you know? his hand, yeah. stuff like that would have been great for PR. This was the opposite. Yeah. It's almost like they don't understand that in this age of social media – you can't do this and not have it immediately get get revealed. And if I remember correctly, the um, the host actually mentioned it. Like mm. for, to his credit, actually mentioned. Like that's how it kind of came out. Yeah, I think I saw so, someone like on Twitter like <laughs> talking about someone was like giving real talk or something about yeah. Kojima and Kojima. No, no, so, yeah, they they yeah. actually were pretty pretty upfront about the like even they thought it was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Our excuse to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. So, this is another sort of news-related segment, but we're going to pose this in reckless speculation. Um, And that is the recent announcement that Telltale is going to do a Batman game. I'm Batman. (laughs) <laughs> yes, we will all be Batman, apparently, which should be pretty fun. Um, I actually was pretty excited about this news. I do like Telltale's games, at least some of them. Um, and this is pretty exciting for me because I'm a huge Batman fan. I think Batman kind of lends itself to this because he does have that investigative side to him, detective mode. Um, what do you think, Doc? Uh, I'm looking for the game where we play as Batman's butler. 
Oh, Alfred? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and Alfred Simulator 2015. Yeah, and, and Batman just goes off, and, and when he comes back, then you have to like go down to the cave and, and sew up his bat suit. Oh, okay. And <laughs> polish the Batmobile. Making some like, like watercrust sandwiches. Cut the crust off his sandwiches. Yes. That's the way Batman likes and, them. And this actually it sounds kind of cool. With your white gloves, <laughs> and, and make sure that you don't... Um, you know, get your suit dirty. You know what? Actually, that would be a really interesting twist on this. If, like, you know, you're playing as Alfred in the Telltale game, and like what you say to Batman actually will like influence the way he behaves. Yeah. And so, like, you're kind, <laughs> you're kind of the one calling the shots in a sense, or at least we're, being a big influence. We're like the only ones that would actually kind of think that's cool. <laughs> they, they would lose so much money if they did that. It's like, oh, by the way, you're not going to play as Batman. You're going to play as Alfred. <laughs> no, people nerdy enough to be listening to this right now. <laughs> but but if, it was, if it was Michael Caine as Alfred, I think that might that could be interesting. That's true. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, so my, my question sure. here is a little bit less about what they're going to do with Batman, because I'm sure they'll come up with something. Um, I'm hoping they go for a little more 70s era Denny O'Neill. Eh, it'll be same old same Batman, old. I'm hoping. But because we'll the logo sort of suggests it's going to be um, like the most recent, like Batman versus Superman, which I know. I is, hope not. I would hope <laughs> not. I'm hoping they go for the more comic related, but I'm hoping that they lean a little bit more towards the, the O'Neill era, which also was the inspiration for the animated series. It's one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan. I'm voting on the Adam West Batman. That would be cool. No, I, hey, that would be very cool. I'd be, I'd be completely on board for that. Um, if they, if they decide to go right, right, I would be shocked if they do. But I would love it. In fact, hell, they have multiple episodes. What if they present the same storyline, but as a different incarnation of Batman? Wow. How do you approach it as Adam, as the Adam West Batman? How do you approach it as like the seventies kind of gritty and Actually, investigative Batman? That would How be do you approach just like the grim dark, like Frank Miller Batman? That would be an interesting way to have different dialogue options. Yeah, as each one's a yeah. different style of Batman. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That would be very, very neat. You could play it as the completely like daring do over the top Adam West style, or you uh-huh. could be like super grim. I'm Batman. Answer to everything. My hands are dead. <laughs> Swear to me. Those are those are your options, or like <laughs> Swear to me. Yeah, my hands yeah. are dead. Or like, hello, citizen. You know, like <laughs> Robin, do you know what this means? <laughs> That would be actually very cool if they could somehow incorporate it so that you could choose your style of Batman to answer. And then, of course, I'm sure people would go bipolar by Batman yeah. and just like, switch it <laughs> off between each of them. Yeah. They, they would have to write in such a way that it would make sense, <laughs> but it would still be kind of like different approaches to it. Mm-hmm. So they kind of did that in The Wolf Among Us, which incidentally was also a DC property, although it was Vertigo. And a yeah, well, technically it, it was under the Vertigo imprint, yeah. and it was it's a creator-owned property. Mm-hmm. So technically not a DC, but I know what you mean. It was printed by yeah. DC. Because um, Vertigo's owned by DC. But in that, in that sort of way, you could play Big B as either kind of, like, a uh, repentant former bad guy or as, like, still pretty much the bad guy, you know? Yeah. Like, there's a lot of different ways you can approach that character, and they still made it make sense. You mean the big bad? Yeah. So the bad guy? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the big oh, bad So, real quick, I'm going to go around the table, and I'm going to say, you're most wanted that next Telltale property, now that they've done Batman, they can do anything. So what do you think, Chris? Oh, I would have to go first. Yeah, one choice. Um... Does it have to be, it, that be a, a video game? No, 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 no anything. Just, Bat, any, Batman any, is no any property. Telltale, 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 Telltale would be doing the video game, but it can be adapted from anything. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Okay, Within so with, tel- television or sure. Doc, you want to go first if you have an idea? Because Chris seems like he's stuck. Um, wow. You know, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah, that could that, be interesting in that universe. Specifically, specifically, the Lord of the Rings. Or is there a specific no, book? Anything but. Uh, the Hobbit or the Lord of the Rings. Okay, movie. so just in the universe, yeah, but some, other characters. Something in the universe. Okay, that could be very interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah I could I could totally get behind that. Chris? I think and it would be very difficult because EA basically has the rights to it, but if they could get Star Wars and do a really good Star Wars game, mm-hmm. I would be super on board with that. Oh, yeah. And would you want them to, again, do Star Wars universe but not the characters? Yeah, yeah, Star Wars. Like something else, and like almost like... I think it'd be cool to do like the like Tales from the Cantina type situation yeah, where you do okay. like... Different characters for each chapter from the Mos Eisley's Cantina mm-hmm. could be very interesting. That'd be interesting. That'd kind of be like, my take on my, it. My ideal take would sort of be like you're a Jedi or a Force user and you're trying to decide if you're going light, dark, gray, that sort of thing. And kind of let the sort of the, the oh, more... Kotor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's Kotor. Well, but do it in kind of Telltale style is what I'm mm-hmm. saying. Yeah. Because I think that they... Because it's a shorter story too. You can have, I think, a more dynamic range of morality in mm-hmm. that. Yeah. I, I would be the Rancor... Um, nursemaid and i would be raising my rancor to be um and into adulthood caring for it and preparing it to to take out that mean old jedi inside the pit um surely he can't win because i've trained my rancor to defeat him mm-hmm. so 
so and then he dies. Let's tell some very sad. Jabba's palace. There. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ra- uh, I'm skipping around. Po- yes. Pocket pet rancor. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess. I guess for me, um, I think it'd be. It might be kind of cool if what to see what they could do with a um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles oh. property, just because it has such a rich history in comics, and if they use some of the the old style, um, very gritty comic art, and really focus on the older incarnation of the turtles and i guess the, the most most recent one in the comics and really take it down that like darker path but also rely on the satire that the that this it was originally made as a satirical like satire of the 80s grimdark comics yeah and they focus on that i think it could be very cool yeah i wouldn't mind seeing firefly either oh that'd be cool that could be interesting as well yeah um okay so we are going to now jump right on in to our round table topic and this is going to be The Walking Dead Season 2. Doc, do you have any initial thoughts on this game? Um, yeah. It, it seemed like they wrote this with the intent of uh, bringing us the conflict in the final episode. It seemed like episodes 1 through 4 were just mm, progression. I can see mm. that. And, and I, I kind of... I don't know. I don't want to hate on on the series. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Because I I love Walking Dead. I even enjoyed Fear the Walking Dead for what it was. Um, Have lots of hopes for that series that's coming out. Um, I thought what they did with, um, what was it called, 400 Days? And and the way that the the whole series um, uses data from your earlier stuff to later stuff. But I think that what we said earlier um, about giving false choices is super important here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I know I'm in Fallout land because I've been playing lots of Fallout, but mm-hmm. I feel like the things that you say in Fallout have immediate, meaningful consequences. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times... Even if they're not long-term, you know, but right. it's it's still important in that particular case. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but a lot of times it, it feels to me like some of the things that you say in Walking Dead just don't have long-term or, or immediate consequences. Yeah. The bottlenecks are really obvious. If, um, for example, if, if you look at a um, either a walkthrough or a plot summary, a plot summary is actually better. Hit the wiki um, and just look at a plot summary of season two. Honestly, it, it it's the same as what you played, and it shouldn't be. Yeah, it shouldn't I, be. I, I it's honestly too freaking. Linear. I felt I felt with this one, and I really I enjoyed season one, and I think season one did a better job of of hiding some of these false choices, and it's possible that was also because it was early enough in, in Telltale Cycle where this was really my first one that I had really del- delved into, yeah. mm-hmm. and that might have been part of it too. I was less savvy to their yeah. tricks, but at the same time, I do think it was put together a little bit better um, than this new one. Um, I still think Wolf Among Us that we've we've talked about that one as well. Um, I still think is kind of the, their height when it comes to hiding those those false choices. Right. Um, but this one, I think, uh, season two didn't quite do it well enough. Um, just so we can preface this for those that haven't played it, um, in season two, you actually are in control of Clementine, mm-hmm. and which was a little girl that you were protecting as Lee in season one. Right. And one of the things that, that really hooked me in season one was um, this really stepping into Lee's character because I wanted to be a good role model for and to protect Clementine. Yeah. So in this one, it felt, I had this very, um, this, this very strong disconnect as I played season two. And it's something that I, I kind of want to know if you guys felt the same way or how mm-hmm. you accepted it. Because while on the one hand, I still felt that protective, um, you know, need to protect Clementine. And I still felt that connection to the character, but I was also playing as that character. Yeah. So I felt like in a meta sense, I was wanting to protect that character. So I was very aware that I was in control of Clementine. Whereas yeah. in season one, that melted away from me. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I was in control of Lee. I felt like I was Lee protecting Clementine. This right. time I felt like I'm me controlling Clementine so she doesn't die. That's a fair point. And that really took me out of it. And that's one yeah. of the things, probably my biggest criticism of the game, not even, even more so than the false choices, was that that aspect of it. Yeah. It Just to speak in game terms for mm-hmm. a moment, um, there was less agency and there was more empathy. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so in that regard, I, I felt a similar way. My my longing as I was playing was for there to have been data points that were tracked or that were not tracked in the first one. And there's nothing we can do about that. That's the way the game was you know, designed. 
it is it remembers I don't know how many things. Let's say it's fifty points of data. Mm-hmm. Um, so season one remembers fifty points of data, which are carried over and can be used as part of your game save. It, it looks for it, it sees it, and it's like, aha, he did thing X mm-hmm. in variable twelve. And there is stuff like that. And there is stuff like that. Yeah. But what I wanted, what I wanted was for her to go. I remember that one time when Lee shot so and so in the face to protect me from the walker. And so to get really specific with something that you you specifically yes, did, yes, an actual choice that I made in season one, causing the dialogue options to be different in season two because of it. Now, you can't go back and just artificially insert a data point, but what you can do is you can design season two with season three in mind. And season three has been announced. Uh, yes. Their contract is very open. I don't know if you've read. Kind of some of the announcements about now, that. Now, are you talking about season three or are you talking about Michonne? Or McCone, or however it's pronounced. Uh, it's, Michonne? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm talking about season three. Okay. I think the Michonne one, isn't that another 400 days? Yeah, where it's, it's like, yeah. like a, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's own standalone. Yeah, it is. Min, it's like a mini, yeah, right? It's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's DLC, if you will. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's, it, it, and, it, and it preloads and presets some of the things. So what I liked about 400 days, let's talk about 400 days. What I liked about it is the character decisions that I made had... Um, sort of made presets, if you will, for um, those characters when they showed up. Yeah. Then in the first episode, which ones would show episode. up or when yeah. or how? Yeah, and yeah. how they would act. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had a mm-hmm. history that I was a keenly aware of. I'm like, oh wait, that's the dude who left his friend to die in the fog. Uh, I can't trust him. And it made it made changes, but it turned out it was artificial. See, mm-hmm. I was going to say right then, I had an interesting experience with it because. Um, simply because I just didn't want to play on my PC for whatever reason, and because it was free on the PS4, mm-hmm. um, I played it on PS4, right? and I didn't have any of my save data. That was all on my PC. Right. I could have played on my PC if I wanted to, because I had bought, I'd bought Season 2 a while ago, but I chose not to. So I didn't have any data. Right. And, and even though there was, every once in a while, there'd be something that would show up that s- seemed like, oh, wait a minute, I didn't quite do that. Mm-hmm. Most Mostly affecting the final choice at the end of... Season one, yeah. where you choose how how Lee dies, like whether she kills him or he kills himself, or what you know that whole moment. Exactly. Um, so th- while that was, they chose that. Otherwise, I didn't really feel like I was missing anything. Well, and this is a problem. To be honest, this is a problem with it's a design problem. It's an unsolvable problem. Um, in in Fallout Three, for example, when they had DLC, if you'd made the choice to kill yourself at the end, Ugh. then suddenly you woke up in a hospital bed. <sighs> If yeah. instead you had made the choice to have your companion die nobly for you, then your companion stayed dead. So it was like, oh, gee, this is horrible. Uh, because it wasn't an, an, an equal equation in that right. regard. This is the same problem that they have for, um, well, like, oh, I lost my example. I had, I had three examples in my head and they just went out. I hate being old. <laughs> um, what were you saying again? You were, you were talking specifically about... I was just talking about how the choices, even though I didn't actually have any save data from, mm-hmm. chap, from save one... Save data, yeah. thank you. Um, it's exactly the same way with Mass Effect. Hmm. Um, I never got that far into Mass Effect 2 or 3 because I couldn't beat 1. I tried so desperately to finish 1, but I got bored. And people were like, oh, 2 is so much better than 1. The problem is I didn't have the save data from finishing one to carry over in the same character in two, and it just when I started it made assumptions that were incorrect about quote unquote my character, and and so this is a problem that you have with the design. Do you do you force people's hands or do you allow them to have the save data that carries over? And then what about these kind of moments? These these media changing moments where you go from PC over to your console, for example. There's an interesting... The reciprocity is um, not there. There's mm-hmm. an interesting solution to that, too, and I don't think they took as much advantage of it as they could have. But mm-hmm. when Dragon Age Inquisition came out, there was the keep. And it basically wasn't going to transfer save data. Yeah. Um, they had established that for a number of reasons. So what they did is they let people actually go into the keep and say what their decisions would have been, or even to change things that they did. Yeah. Um, and then all those data points were carried over into your game. And so there's kind of the default world state, but they're very clear about you're going to use the default world state, or it's you can like import creating your keep. character. Yeah, kind yeah. of. Yeah. And so if they did, like, say more of that in Mass Effect, or even in this, you know, like you can sort of say, okay, well, I didn't, I don't have my save data from one anymore, season one. So I'm going to go through and say Lee did this, 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 and this. I think they should have done that for this one. The only problem is 
it almost would be pointless. Mm-hmm. Not almost, it pretty much would be pointless. Aside from maybe like one decision, it didn't really affect anything. Like no. I said, I didn't really feel like I was missing. When I first started playing, I, I was like, oh, I might have to quit at a certain point because if I feel like it's totally different from what I had experienced in season one, I'm not going to be able to keep playing. Mm-hmm. But I never felt that. Um, I, I will say that that overall, I think I think that's probably because of the way they, they set those choices up. Um, to me, it felt more like this would have worked really well as a comic or um, a television series, yeah. a short series, a miniseries, as opposed to a game, because the choices just didn't really feel dynamic enough for yeah. me. Yeah, and, and that's the problem I had with it. it. I know in the first season, you could have people die, and they wouldn't be there for the rest of the episodes. They, there was whole pieces of con- swaths of content, yeah. conversations with people that weren't there because they had died. I just didn't see that happening. Maybe it was the way, you know, my personal playthrough. No, there was but a few moments where I, I could tell where... Um, this is the moment where this character dies. Yes. And it, was, and it was like, well, maybe this character could have been... Um, and I'm trying to remember his name, the guy who... Um, you kill his, like, the eight... Like, I think it's like a, some Asian guy on a bridge, and you mm-hmm. kill him. And then when you finally meet, go to the house and you, you meet up with the rest of the party, they're all waiting for him to come back, but you know that he's dead. And so eventually, when they find out, um, this is, do y'all kind of remember who I'm talking about? The guy, the, it was the old, older balding guy who's the cook, mm-hmm. and he finds out who I can't, I can't remember names. I'm sorry, it's been it's been a few weeks. Well, since that's I telling, this. isn't it? It is telling because the, the the characters weren't meaningful enough. Yeah, I mean, Lee's barely even mentioned in this one, and yet we're all like Lee Everett, man. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. that that dude was awesome, and I played as him. They mentioned him. They mentioned him sometimes, but mm-hmm. you're right. There's, I think, I mean, one of the most powerful moments in this game, in this game for me, was that moment where um, Clementine Clementine wakes up. You know, she's been she's been injured. She's been shot, right? And she passes out, and she wake she quote wakes up on the RV back in season one mm-hmm. and you're sort of seeing a different angle of of season one now instead of controlling lee you're controlling clementine in a right. similar scene and you get to have this exchange where lee's giving you sort of life advice and that was a very powerful scene no, that me. was the strongest scene in the entire but series it's hilarious that so that, yeah. that scene was so powerful and it's from a character that was really from season one mm-hmm. right you know the characters aside from and um uh, Kenny. Mm-hmm. Aside from Kenny, I mean, I think yeah. I, I liked Kenny's character. I thought he was a very interesting character. Um, I also felt like the game kind of went out of its way to well, you know, Kenny's, make Kenny Kenny's kind a of season one character too, right? Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. They uh, they kind of went out of their way in this one. There, where at first it was like, oh, maybe they're gonna like somewhat kind of redeem Kenny, and they sort of did. Mm-hmm. But then they also went out of their way, at least from my perspective, it's, it felt like they were going out of their way to make you see Kenny as like crazy and you had to kill him yeah and i just felt like i felt too forced because mm-hmm. it gets to a certain point where uh what's her name the the, the, cra- the crazy psycho woman who decides at to the end. at the end yeah who just who, i knew exactly what she was doing that was the annoying yeah. part i knew exactly her trick we'll talk about the ending too because we need to do spoilers here where and, and that was the, the decision that you were talking about that all led up to and yeah. i completely agree so she takes the baby um that you know of course kenny was really protective mm-hmm. and wanted to help this baby and raise the baby which make all made sense and she takes the baby and she hides the baby when she when they get separated. Yeah. And then she comes back and, and and tries to basically goad Kenny into a fight by saying, "Oh no, I lost the baby." Clearly, she had stashed the baby. It made perfect sense that yeah. she because she'd always been this whole time trying to get Clementine to realize, "Oh, he's crazy," even though he really hadn't done anything yeah, that crazy. She's framing him, so she's trying to frame him. And this whole time, you're thinking, um, "Why can't I just say that? Why can't I just go, hey, wait a minute, baby's okay, or like run off and find the baby because they had a story they wanted to tell, and this right. is what's going to happen. So it all comes down to that choice, and now it's like he's about to you know, knife her and kill her and stuff, and you're like, I mean, I, I ended up shooting Kenny because I'm like, I don't know what else to do. It's like you have to do it. Yeah. You don't have to. You could have. I literally you stood there yeah. and just let him knife her. Yeah, because... that wouldn't surprise me. I almost did the same thing, and and at the end of it, at the end of it, I couldn't. You know, at the end of that too, when when you're talking with her, and she's like, "Oh, I had to do it," blah blah blah, and then she wanted to stay. I'm like, "No, I don't want to stay with you. Get the hell out of here!" And I went off by myself because yeah. there's no way I was going to stay with this psycho. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want. I I was like, well, I can't let I can't just stand there and let Kenny kill her. But at the same time, I'm like, she's completely at fault for all of this, so I don't want anything to do with her either. Mm-hmm. So it's just this whole situation where I know they that was part of the whole. Um, the point of that powerful moment with uh, with Lee, where he says, "You know, sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you have to kind of be to make the make bad decisions in order to, right. to get by." But in this point, it, that almost that wasn't really the case. Really, your decision could have been, 
oh, hold on, I'm gonna I'm gonna like run off and grab this baby that I know she stashed. Yeah. Or at least mention the possibility, like, hey, hold on a second, she probably stashed the baby because this entire time she's been trying to convince you that Kenny's unstable, that Kenny's right? unstable yeah. and that you need to go with her and leave Kenny. So they've been it's clearly been set up that she's going and you know that she's she's willing to do anything because mm-hmm. she's proven that she's willing to do anything to to you know basically convince you of this so it makes perfect sense that she would have done this yeah. so even if she hadn't done it even if she really had lost the baby you still should have thought as a character oh she's probably trying to so find sh- or does it give you the option I don't believe so. No, basically, the, the choice comes down to dismiss her or let her stay. See, yes. when, when he's sitting there bleeding all over the place, going, what have I done, what have I done? Yeah. You have the option to just shoot him right there. Oh, really? See, yeah. that, and that also shows that this it's way too geared against Kenny for some reason. Yeah. And I actually thought, to me, I thought Kenny was, even though, yes, he had, he certainly would sometimes have anger issues, it was always, he was always trying to do what he felt was best for the group. That's the message of Walking Dead, isn't it? I mean, if you follow the series, if you if you look at season one, if you look at season two, mm-hmm. if you look at the spinoff series, it's you have to do uncomfortable things that we as the human race would deem as unsavory in order to survive and in order to save the people around you. And that's where it comes down is you've got this beautiful theme, and I think this is Kirkman's genius. Where does that line between doing something unpleasant to survive make you into the enemy, into the bad guy, into the evil person, Mm -hmm. when doing that exact same thing sacrificially in order to, for the people who you are with to survive, makes it a noble act. And I think that that's the beauty of it, is the juxtaposition of person A over here and person B over here are doing the exact same thing, but they're doing it in, and they do different things and one is good and one is evil. And then the situation changes and they do the reverse thing mm-hmm. and they're still good and evil or reverse. I think that's the beauty of that world and of that setting is that it tells that story over and over and over. Now here's my butt, my big hairy butt, is that with Put Clementine <laughs> at the end... It's lucky you're, this is an audio podcast. Yes, audio only. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what, what you've got is they're being preachy. Mm-hmm. And and I, I still have yet to figure out entirely whether or not they've committed the cardinal sin of branching narrative, which is to make both option A and option B, both option A and option B right. In the sense that not morally ambiguous, right? But in the sense that um, do 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 you kick the cat or do you kick the puppy? Remember, <laughs> no, remember right, that? right. Um, in in the sense that you've what you've got is something that in the old choose your own adventure books, the old hag, you can toss her in the oven or you can be nice to her. If you toss her in the oven, she's a witch. If you're nice to her, she's someone's grandmother. Yeah. In other words, it's it's Schrodinger's witch. Because <laughs> until you choose, the outcome is not... And, and, and this, this was an old thing that was done in these books, is the nature of it changed. And I have yet to be able to figure out whether or not Kenny's, call it character, is consistent throughout all the writing. Or if it changes based on your choice, you know what it, I'm seems to, it seemed to me that it was pretty consistent. Yeah, I think so too. I think so and too. I, and but... I think they were trying to cast him as sort of more. They were trying to cast him as more of a villain, and I think it yeah. was something that got me. Where it'd be one thing if he's just presented as a character, and she's presented. I can't remember her name. She's presented as a character, and you're supposed to just decide for yourself which one you think is right and which one you think is wrong. But that wasn't the impression that I got. They, It really felt to me like they were consistently trying to set you up to think, basically because of the reactions of other people around you. They were all trying to set you up to think that Kenny's a bad guy. Even those people that steal your that steal the truck and, like, shoot Clementine, they were, tr- they were trying to present them as good people. Well, I, mean, I, think, I think they were... It, it's a theme that they had going. I think they actually did a really good job with it. Because screw them. Where... Basically, it's trying to set up, like, you know, are you going to be loyal and cling to the past, or are you going to basically commit to this new group? And that's kind of a big thing. And it's like, also, to a degree, are you going to go with what Lee taught you? And part of that is kind of the meta sense. Like, as you as a player, are you going to try to play Clem like Lee would have wanted her to be played, in a sense? Um, But, you know, you've got this new group, and then this person from your past comes into play, and your two groups, your two lives, in a sense, are in conflict. You kind of have to pick which life are you going to commit to. And for me, with the whole Kenny thing, I thought it was an excellent um, 
like we talked about, you guys mentioned like the empathetic sort of thing. Um, I, I found the plot line with Kenny to be really strong because the entire time I was concerned with what he was doing, but I was trying, like I was defending him to the death. I was constantly like, no guys, give him a chance. He's doing the right, or he's got good intentions talking to him, trying to bring him down all this different stuff. Oh yeah. Like, I was doing the same thing. And like, it came down to like, it was up until the moment he was about to knife her that it's like, I got, but, like, cause I cared about both characters right. and it's like, okay, I got to stop the one who's about to kill the other one. But it also felt like they were trying, like, I don't think if you had done the opposite and never said, never tried to um, calm him down, never tried to defend him, it wouldn't have changed that final moment. And that's the problem. Yeah. You spend all that time trying to help Kenny and it seems like what you're doing is helping just given the way that he's reacting to it, but it's really not. They're going to they're gonna have that same moment at the end no matter what you do. Yeah. And that's, I think, really does a disservice to the, the, the choices in the game. They're she, not really she flipped choices. out. She went crazy. So the fact that she attacked him and he was defending himself yeah. by stabbing her, he took it too far, but it's understandable. Yeah, I, I thought in the context. Of the no, I, I don't blame you. I, I I actually really did think about the decision, and you know, I I made a decision which maybe I wouldn't have made mm-hmm. if I went back and, and did the exact same thing again. But at the same time, I didn't I didn't like her either. I knew yeah. what she was doing. So it's like it's. I just felt that for some reason the game decided from the start that it was going to bring Kenny back and then make him into this. No matter what you do, he's unhinged and he's yeah. going to like even when after you shoot him and you talk to him because I know Chris made that same choice and you go up, he even says something like, "Oh yeah, you made the right decision." Mm-hmm. It's total. It's BS. It's complete BS. Well, did anybody get the ending with the mall? Because like, I think if you guys dismissed her, you probably didn't see it um, with the, the mall. Yeah, the, you, you're you the go back to the, like the the big um, warehouse store or yeah, yeah, and and th- that's basically where it ends. Mm-hmm. And this family comes up. And, 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 and don't get me wrong. Some, I think I think it was the same. There's some the really changes. beautiful things mm. that that they do. Subtle, beautiful things. Like there's this line that the guy who comes up he says, "Please, as a father, mm. let let me help." And and what you see is him. He's with a woman of a different race than him, and a little boy mm. who's of an, another different race mm. than him. And they so, say that this is their son. And, and, yeah. and yeah, and so clearly that's not true. Clearly that's. Um, at least he's not the bio dad. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of ways that that could go with that. And I was like, my my take was kind of like I was just going to go with the assumption, give them the benefit of the doubt, and say it's an adopted son. Right. You know exactly. So you saw the scene too? Yeah. I didn't see the scene. Oh. Uh, well, I actually watched the scene because I went back and, and watched the oh. video with the all the endings. But um, what what I liked about that um, that moment is it, it's a final moral decision for her to make based on everything that else has happened. Um, and, and either you're you're there with uh, what's her name who we can't remember because she's not a memorable character, um, or she got stabbed and she's not there I guess. But the the point is, if you turn them away, he turns around and walks away, and it zooms in on the gun in his back pocket, mm. like saying you made the right choice, good job. He's a bad man. He has a well, gun. Well, you, you see that too if you let them in though. Like he turns around, he's got a gun in his pocket, and you're kind of like Clem gets this concerned look on her face. Wait, like, why? Why does that make him a bad person, though? Exactly, it's the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> so once again, if I you're think, in a zombie apocalypse and you don't have a gun with you, you're just an idiot. Yeah, exactly. That's when I wouldn't want to go with you. I'm like, look, you're a dumbass. I, I, I don't think the whole point of that scene is that basically the same thing happens both ways. You know, you're going to see the gun. It basically comes down to do you do you as the player as Clem feel like you can trust anyone anymore? Because they're going to have the gun. Right. The gun's always there. The yeah. question is. What do you choose to do about trusting this person? You know, and so when you see the gun, does that mean like, oh, I made the right choice? Or sometimes people can interpret it as like, oh, okay, he's got a gun, but I just still don't trust people. You know, and so I think that that's more open to interpretation, unless them telling you you made the right choice because he has a gun and he was turned away. That's valid, I guess. I suppose. Well, um, I guess we'll go around and, and any sort of like final thoughts y'all want to give on the on the game. Chris? Yeah, because I, I I want to go back for a minute to sort of what we were talking about earlier, and um, you guys were talking, yeah. Um, you guys were talking about, you know, do you think that, you know, you felt agency with Clem? And I actually think I did. I think that they did a smart thing where you start off the season and it's got elements that were carried over from season one, like who's with you and that sort of thing. And then, you know, kind of expectedly, they sort of dismantle all that and sort of give you a reset and you move forward from there basically fresh. So mm-hmm. they didn't have to worry too much about what happened before. Um And by the end of that first episode, I think I felt like I went from sort of empathizing with Clem to being Clem. And I think it was because of like all the stuff she has to go through in that first episode to kind of get into the house and fix herself up and that sort of stuff and become part of the group. And by then I felt like I had agency. Um, So that wasn't an issue for me. Overall, I think it was really good. Um, It had some really awesome 
uh, powerful moments. It had some really gut-wrenching decisions, I thought. Um, like, I think one of the hardest decisions for me in the game was who do I uh, sit at the, the table with? Do I sit with Kenny when you first meet him again, or do I sit with the new group? Mm-hmm. And I pondered that one long and hard, and I sat with my new group, and I felt, like, super bad when Kenny mm-hmm. looked away looking dejected. Because it's like, ah, you know, i got to be, like, I, I'm with this group now. I've got to be loyal to them, yeah. you know? I just, like, but immediately sat with Kenny. And I was like, oh, no. dead by the end of the thing. Yeah, yeah. So. that's yeah. him. Um, so, I mean, I thought that there were things that were great. There's things that weren't so great. I don't want to talk too long about it because we're coming up on our time limit. Um, there were a few places where the false choice felt really bad. Like, it was it was obvious. Like, the uh, the kid who you're about to rob for the medicine um, I, I didn't rob him at all. Oh, and yet, that decision was so yeah, lame. I didn't rob him at all, and yet he went back and said that they robbed him, and that's why we got attacked. Uh-huh. It would have been better even like if they just slightly tweaked it and said um, that, like, you know, he tries to protest. It's like, no, no, they didn't rob me. They're like, you know, I, they gave me my stuff back. It's right. like, shut up. We're going to handle this. And you know? also, that's... But like, acknowledge that you didn't do the thing. Yeah. yeah. And no, that choice annoyed me also because your choice was either give him back all the drugs or take them all. There was no like, I'm going to take a couple of these pills, but here you go. You can have the rest of them because mm-hmm. he'd still be fine with minus a few pills. There was no like, I'll just take a little bit compromised. It was either all or nothing. Mm-hmm. That's BS. Yeah. yeah. So from a medicines, you should steal everything from everyone every time because they did the exact same thing in, in season one. You remember there was an open car? The yes. Were on, yes. Yes. And it was like, do you steal it? Do you not? And I was like, no, we will leave it. We will walk away. And I did that they in did season that. one. Yeah, yeah. They exactly. Come after you. Exactly. You stole our stuff. <laughs> no, yeah. we didn't. So I don't know what, I don't know what's going on in the writer's minds with that one. Maybe it's just lazy. Maybe it's a, a failure to understand that moment from the player's perspective or something. And from, from a certain perspective, you can sort of say that, you know, not all humans are rational, and sometimes they're going to get in their own head. That even if you're not actually guilty of something, you're guilty of something. Chris, that's probably the biggest understatement <laughs> of, that I've ever heard. Yes, not um, all humans are rational. But that being said, it doesn't feel good in a game where your choices are supposed to matter. Right. For it to just be right. the cop out excuse of like, well, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. And you know, if you really want to have fun with it, reverse it. Make it so that stealing it is the right choice, and not stealing it's the wrong choice. Because someone dies. Yeah. Exactly. You know, there's lots of ways. That's what it should have, especially with the medicine, because the whole reason why I took it was because I'm thinking, I don't know what this guy's going to use it for, but I know that our group might need it. Right. So I have to take it to protect my people. I don't, I don't even know his people. So you have to make that choice at a certain point. If I was actually there, I would have only taken some of them, but they didn't give me that option. Yeah. Which is why in, in Fallout 4, I had the moral dilemma of how many people have I actually murdered? Just, I mean, they're they're raiders. They're they're basically a clan. It's been two hundred years. They have their own civilization. They're the dominant culture around here. And I'm just walking in, and I'm just committing mass murder so that I can do what? Stop them from stealing from a farm down the road that I happen to think is the. the anyway, all right. <laughs> Um, and with that, I think we're we're yeah. getting ready to wrap Just up here. Kind of a final comment. Oh, okay. um, I do think that it's worth playing through, especially if you like season one. Um, you might be a little bit disappointed in some ways, but I think it's definitely worth the playthrough. It also makes me very intrigued to see what else Telltale can do with season twos. Like, I really want to see a Wolf Among Us oh, season oh, two. I see what you're saying. I want to see. Um, a Tales from the Borderlands season two for sure, that sort of thing. So the fact that they did a season two and that it was, I think, fairly successful at least, yeah. um, is encouraging for the future. So I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what they do from here. Well, moving forward, they need to start thinking about their season twos during season one so they can track those data points. Either that or just start tracking everything. And I know that's easy to say. Mm-hmm. Precisely. I know. I that, and I agree with that too. Uh, and that'd be my thought. I, I mean, I agree with your with your thought about. I do think it's worth playing through if you enjoyed season one. Uh, and if you enjoy these sort of games, these adventure games, if you have not played season one, I do not recommend starting with season two. No, you don't, should you don't. should play season one yeah, first. Absolutely. You know, now four hundred days, I honestly don't think is essential. I enjoyed four hundred days, but if for whatever reason you play season one and you want to go straight into season two, I don't think you're necessarily. I disagree. Missing I think for out. the full experience, you should play the four hundred days as well. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying don't. I'm I'm saying I I wouldn't call it. Essential. Essential. I think if you don't play season one, season two is not going to have anywhere near the impact. I don't think 400 Days had a huge impact. And the reason why I'll say that is because until you mentioned 400 Days, I forgot I'd even played it. Ah. No joke. So I had this weird moment where when you said 400 Days, I, I, it all started flooding back. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember doing that. And I remember those characters. Mm-hmm. And they were the same ones in season two. But I had totally forgotten when I was playing, when I was playing yeah. it. i got to be honest. It was a bridge. It yeah. was a bridge between and, one of And I remember enjoying 400 Days quite a bit, actually. Yeah, yeah. I enjoyed it more than season two. It was short. Yeah. 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 Um, Doc, any final thoughts from you? Um, no, I've actually spoken quite a bit on it. Um, they, 
the thing that I, I really want to reiterate, though, is I think this is a cool new subgenre of games. Mm -hmm. Call it interactive comic books, interactive stories, yeah, interactive yeah. whatever, if and you I, want. I agree. It's, it's interactive narrative kind of yeah. thing. I mean, it's, it's but, less gamey because those choices are just not mattering enough yeah. for me. Um, but what, what I want to see change is the QTE stupid mm -hmm. um, adjusting to QTE cool. Um, so that it's not reload and do it until you get it right. Um, I want it to be, you failed that, we're moving on. Yeah. Uh, I, I like I like that. That would be great. So much yeah. better. Um, the second thing is, I want these stories to to follow the, the meaningful patterns of good writing like the TV show. I want them to be really, really thinking about what is moving forward. And then this brings me to the last point, which is, and bridging us into season next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because Agreed. the the Walking Dead has always as a TV show had its own arc within that uh, season, but it's also mm -hmm. set it up for the next season every single time. Right. And I'm just not seeing that with these um interactive stories. I agree. I mean it's like, I I will say this, leave it on this, but aside from the the lack of of proper setup per se, I actually thought season 1 um, was better written than a lot of the stuff that we had from the actual television series. I can see that. Um, not the whole thing. There's certainly some seasons that I thought were very well done. But I think season one for Walking Dead was actually quite well written. Season two, I didn't really feel that. I think the settings were brilliant in season one. Yeah. Of the game. Yeah, I agree. Um, by season four-ish of the TV show, I was like, guys, get out of Georgia. Yeah. Just get out of Georgia. Seriously. They've got Georgia on their mind, man. Yeah, that's, Georgia. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. And with, with those terrible puns, uh, I think we're going to uh, sign off here. Yeah, thank uh, you, for everyone, for joining us for yes. episode number 53 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast, our roundtable discussion on The Walking Dead Season 2. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. And I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to join the discussion on our website, backward-compatible.com. You bring a unique perspective, and dialogue makes everyone better. Leave a comment in our podcast section, and if it's good, one of the crew members will respond to it. This time, tell us your thoughts on The Walking Dead Season 2. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.